Welcome to the Man of Recaps. This is The Rings of Power, Season 1. Welcome back to Middle-earth for the Lord of the Rings prequel. Many thousands of years ago, the elves lived in their own paradise place of Alinor. But one day, the light of their tree started dying because the Dark Lord Morgoth uh, started Dark Lording. So the elves had to leave their homeland of Valinor and sail to Middle-earth to fight him. It was an epic war, but in the end, they defeated Morgoth at great cost. Our main character is the elf Galadriel. Yeah, who's still alive in Lord of the Rings, because remember, elves are immortal. Unless, of course, they're killed, like Galadriel's brother was, by Morgoth top general, Sauron. So she swears to get revenge, and that's where this story picks up with Galadriel out hunting for Sauron. Now in Lord of the Rings, she was real calm, peaceful Galadriel, but in her youth, she was an epic warrior. Oh yeah. She tracks Sauron to this fortress where apparently he was trying to smith something, but except for his strange pitchfork logo, the trail runs cold. So she goes home to Elf City where her best friend is Elrond. Yeah, he's a youngster here too. Now Galadriel wants to keep hunting Sauron, but the Elf King's like, yo, he's clearly gone. The war is over. We're disbanding the military. So Galadriel's forced into retirement, being shipped back off to their paradise continent, Valinor. But at the last minute, she's like, yeah, no thanks. She bails off the boat. She knows Sauron is still out there. And indeed, evil is secretly rising in the peaceful Southlands. The humans here sided with Morgoth back in the war, so the elves are still keeping a close eye on them. It's this guy's job, Arendir. But now orders come in, evil is gone, the army's disbanded, which is too bad for him because he's got a flirtation going with the human here, Bronwyn. Luckily, he has an excuse to stick around when a cow gets sick, which leads him to discover the next village over has been destroyed and he's captured by orcs. And they've already dug tunnels under our village. Oh, orc sneak attack. Luckily, she manages to take this one out. Like, hey, Southlanders, time to evacuate. Meanwhile, Elrond has been recruited for a special mission by the master elven smith, Calabrimbor. He wants to build a super special new forge, but the elves can't do it alone. They need help from the dwarves. So Elrond goes to the dwarven city of Khazad-dûm, currently in its golden age. Now, Elrond's old friends with the dwarven prince here, Durin, but Durin's mad at him at the moment because he hasn't called in 40 years, so the best bros have to work it out by smashing some rocks together. Then he brings him home to meet his new wife, who is super nice, and these two are super cute together. And so these two are best friends again. The dwarves agree to help. And there's one more group we're following this season, the Harfoots, little people that are peaceful and happy and very clearly ancestors of hobbits. Here we follow a young mischievous Harfoot named Nori, who likes going on adventures with her best friend Poppy. One night a meteor crashes nearby, but it's no space rock, it's a naked man. Who's this guy? Is it Sauron? Well, he definitely has some magic powers. He's kind of a man baby at the moment, doesn't know how to talk or be human, so Nori befriends him, tries to help him out, and I'm pretty sure this dude's Gandalf. So out in the middle of the ocean, Galadriel's starting to think she's made a huge mistake. Luckily, she finds a random raft of humans, one who's this hot guy Halbrand, but almost immediately a sea monster attacks, kills the rest of them, so she and Halbrand get some alone time. And they do the thing where they don't get along at first, so you know they're gonna hook up later. But now they're picked up by a real boat and brought to the legendary island island kingdom of Numenor. Their ancestors sided with the elves against Morgoth in the war, so they were granted this beautiful island. But right now, the political climate is anti-elf, so Galadriel and the queen don't get along. She's put under house arrest and guarded by the sea captain who found her, Elendil. Elendil, wait, why do I know that name? Well, you might know my more famous son, Isildur. Yes, ancestor of Aragorn and the guy who, well, no spoilers, I guess, if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings. For now, though, he's a brash young man who wants to drop out of boat college to go adventuring in Middle Earth, but his father Father's like, son, you can't drop out of boat college to be an adventurer. Ironically, though, he has no problem with his daughter going to art school. Anyway, Galadriel's house arrest includes the library, where she discovers she's been holding Sauron's symbol sideways. It's not a pitchfork, it's a map of the Southlands. And this is an interesting coincidence, because her new friend Halbrand has this pouch with a symbol on it that is the royal symbol of the Southlands. Yes, he's doing the Aragorn thing, where he's the long-lost king, but he doesn't want it because his ancestors sided with the bad guys. In the Southlands, the orcs have taken Arendir prisoner, but he stages a prison break, and he's got those Legolas elf superpowers. Hours, yeah. In the end, he's caught again and brought before the orc leader. Oh man, that's definitely Sauron. But he claims not to be Sauron. He's like, I'm a totally different guy. My name's Adar. Meanwhile, the humans have evacuated to the elf tower, but they're running out of food. So Bronwyn's doofus son goes back to the village to find some, but he also finds a super evil looking sword that if you put your blood in it becomes shadow sword. More on that later. Anyway, Adar let Elf Guy go to bring a message, surrender or die. Bronwyn steps up to be a leader, I vote we fight, but this coward bartender guy's like, no, I vote we surrender. He takes a group to the orcs, like, hey, we pledge allegiance to you, Lord Sauron. Adar's like, bro, I'm telling you, I'm not Sauron. Really? Back in Elfland, the construction project's going great with a newfound cooperation between dwarves and elves, but Elrond suspects both sides are hiding something. 
he asks his friend Durin, who's like, okay, but you gotta promise not to tell, because we found this new metal that is like super cool. We call it Mithril. Only problem is it's super dangerous to mine. In fact, the tunnel collapses right now. And turns out the elves know all about Mithril. That's the real reason they sent Elrond in the first place. See, way back in the Age of Legends, some dude was fighting a Balrog, and like the power of the gods went into this tree, which then seeped down into the mountains, made Mithril. And now, for unknown reasons, the elves are losing their immortality. Their only hope is that the Mithril can reinvigorate it. That's what the Super Forge is for. They want to make a bunch of Mithril for like all the elves to wear. So Elrond tells Durin, hey, we need your help. And it's like, hey, bro, I got you. But it's not Durin they need to convince. It's Durin's father, the king, Durin Sr. And he's like, look, mining the Mithril is too dangerous. I'm not going to risk dwarven lives to save the elves who, you know, it's unfair they're immortal anyway. But Durin's not going to let his best friend die. So these two go down to mine it themselves and they succeed. They find the Mithril Motherlode going way down to the mountain. Just then, though, Durin's dad catches him and he's none too pleased. He banishes Elrond and strips his son Durin of his princely collar. He shuts down the Mithril mining. It's just too dangerous. And ironically, he's totally right, because down in the depths, they might waken an ancient evil. Yeah, the Balrog! He doesn't wake up this season, though, but watch out for him in season two. Now back to the Harfoots. They're getting ready for their big migration, but Nori's dad breaks his ankle. And normally Harfoots all stick together, but on the migration, it's the pirate's code. If you fall behind, you're left behind. But luckily Nori's new friend, Hobo Gandalf, is here to help him push their cart. And these two bond have great times. She teaches him how to speak words. And he's a real helpful guy, not just for pushing carts, but if wolves attack for doing magic on him. But sometimes he can't control his powers. He, oh, almost accidentally hurts Nori. And there's another peril closing in behind them because this strange group of people are tracking our spaceman. Man. Now back to Galadriel, who wants Numenor's help to go save the Southlands from Sauron, but the queen hears like, sorry, can't help you. She shows Galadriel the Palantir she has. This one shows the future, where Galadriel's arrival ends with Numenor's destruction swallowed by the sea. So yeah, you see, it's not personal, but you gotta get out of here. But just then, their magic tree starts shedding leaves, which is as good a sign as any that you're on the wrong path. So now Queen Muriel's like, change of plans, Numenor. We're helping Galadriel sailing off to war. But the Make Numenor Great Again movement is not happy about this, and their leader is this Chancellor Farazan. And he's a really good politician, manages to calm this crowd and get them on board with the war, but also somehow make it about vote for me. And this guy has an absolutely glorious beard-hair combo, something which his son, Kevin, uh, does not. He's been flirting with Isildur's sister and generally seems like a nice guy, but he reveals he's kind of a douche, like, hey, dad, we hate elves. Why do you support this war? It's like, first off, Kevin, get a haircut. And secondly, if we sail to war and save the Southlands, we can rule the Southlands. We'll be England, Middle Earth's America. It'll be awesome. And so it's happening. Galadriel in full shiny armor, sailing off with Numenor to save the Southlands. And not a moment too soon, because Adar and the Orcs are marching on the village. Elf guy sets a home alone trap for him at the tower. Yeah, take that. But there's always more Orcs. Now they're fighting at the village. Oh, peasants versus Orc fight. In the end, the peasants win until they realize these Orcs they fought were the people that defected. Yeah, he sent them first. Then Adar rolls up with the full Orc army and easily subdues him. Now he really wants the shadow sword and to save his mom, the kid gives it up. But wait, now who's this coming? Yes, the Numenor cavalry riding in. Nothing like a cavalry charge to save the day. And Isildur, by the way, is here too. He gets his wish to fight in the battle and have a grand adventure. Galadriel pulls off a sick move where she dodges an arrow outside of the horse. Yeah, take that. This other guy tries to copy her, but he doesn't quite have that elven core strength. So Adar is trying to escape with the sword, but Halbrand shows he's got the ab strength to get down there. Oh, trip the horse. And now Galadriel's interrogating him, like, so come on, you're Sauron, right? But he's like, no, I'm telling you, I'm a different person. Sauron abandoned us to go off blacksmithing, so it's up to me to try to give our people a home. Remember in Lord of the Rings how Sauron explained that the orcs used to be elves that were corrupted by dark powers? Well, that's me. I'm the first one of those, and that's why I kind of look like an elf still, but I really am an orc. And it's an interesting moral flip here, as he's like, look, I just want a homeland for my people. We orcs have as much right to live as anyone else. And Galadriel's the one who's like, nah, orcs are pure evil and ugly. I'm going to just genocide you all. Anyway, for now, the Southlands are saved. And good news, we found your long lost king. And these peasants haven't invented democracy yet, so they're like, oh, this is amazing. All hail King Halbrand. But now what's the deal with this shadow sword? Well, turns out Tadar did a switcheroo, gave the real sword to the bartender guy who all sticks it in the thing. Turns out it's the key that opens the dam and releases the river. And all these tunnels the orcs were digging were not just to hide. Turns out they all lead to the mountain, a mountain that's actually a volcano. And now with the water added, boom! And it's not a small eruption with a little bit of lava. It's a massive Mount St. Helens wall of smoke and death. Uh, no bueno for the Southlands. This was Adar's master plan to create a land of permanent shadow, perfect for the orcs. And in case you hadn't realized it yet, the Southlands are Mordor. 
Galadriel survives because she's got super elf powers, and Doofus Kid survives too because he's got super plot powers. His hot mom survives too, along with his hot new elven stepdad. The queen survives too, although she is blind now, but it's Isildur who was down in a burning building when Howitt collapsed on him. Because this is a prequel, we know Isildur lives, but his dad Elendil, oh, so sad. So Numenor is going to retreat for now, but the queen vows to come back with an even bigger army, and Galadriel's like, nice, I'll get the elves on board too. And so as the important people go off to do important things, uh, the Southland villagers are going to rebuild, I guess, slightly north of the Southlands. Now the Harfoots are approaching their rest stop, the beautiful Apple Grove, but unfortunately, it's close to the Southlands, torched by the volcano. Maybe Gandalf tries to magically save some trees, but all he manages to do is almost kill some Harfoots. So it's finally like, hey man, thanks, and I'm sorry, but maybe you are too dangerous to keep around. But the next day, it turns out, his magic worked, the apples are saved. <laughs> yeah, you feel bad for sending him off now. But now Eminem has caught up to him, and it's like, wait, who are you, be you friend or foe? They don't say anything, but they light all the apple carts on fire. Oh, they foe. For the Harfoots, this is an extinction level event, but Nori's dad gives a speech about sticking together, which makes Nori realize, I gotta go save Gandalf. Because indeed, the real Slim Shady has caught up to him, but they're not here to fight him, they're here to serve him. They think he is Sauron. They're gonna take him to a special place where you can see this constellation and he'll get his memories and his powers back. But his Harfoot friends are here to rescue him. Unfortunately, they're no match for fireballs. Nori's like, hey man, we need your help, but he's feeling bad because now he thinks he's evil. And it's like, dude, good and evil aren't something you're born with. You can choose to be whoever you want. And so he chooses good, stands up for his Harfoot friends. These guys are like, oh, it's not Sauron. He's the other one. Yeah, bro, I told you, I'm Gandalf. Boom, banished. And so for the Harfoots, the day is saved. Uh, except old village elder guy, he died. Now back to the elves, where Galadriel and Elrond fill each other in. While Halbrand hangs out at their cool new forge, turns out he is something of a smith himself. He's like, wow, what's this cool metal? But it's like, hey, don't touch that. It's expensive. And it's the only mithril we have. It's like, hey, I know you're the master smith Calabrimbor, but I mean, I just had the idea. What if you mixed it with some other metals to, you know, spread it out? And Calabrimbor's super embarrassed. He didn't think of that. So they have a new plan. With this much mithril, they can make one crown. If the elven king wears it, it can maybe radiate light to all the elves, keep them immortal. But as Calabrimbor explains, what they're trying to do, it sounds exactly like what Adar told her Sauron was trying to do. And now she's looking at her friend Halbrand very suspiciously, which is awkward because this would be a fantastic time to make out if she didn't suspect him of being a Dark Lord. And now she finds proof that the line of Southland Kings is confirmed ended. It's like, who are you really? And he goes full Breaking Bad, say my name, Dark Lord Sauron? You're goddamn right. She tries to kill him, but he traps her in a raft dream where it's like, look, I'm not a bad guy. If you rewatch the season, I never lied to you. My story is the same as Halbrand's. I used to serve Morgoth, but now I'm free to be better. His plan is to make two magic crowns and save Middle Earth with him and Galadriel ruling together. He's like, hey, baby, I won't be a Dark Lord if you're by my side, the Lady of Light. But she's not having it. She's like, look, clearly you are super evil. And he's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe I am. So he disappears, but Galadriel decides not to tell her friends it's Sauron who's been helping him because the elves still need this mithril. But now she has a new idea. One crown is bad because it could corrupt that person, and two is bad because it could corrupt them both in the war. They need three. Three super elves that can find balance. But it's like, hey, we don't have enough mithril for three crowns. We need something smaller. And so the forging of the three elven rings has begun. As season one comes to an end, the Harfoots are going to finish their migration, except for Nori, who's going to go on an adventure. She's going to be the sidekick for her new wizard friend. And even though they never say Gandalf yet, he starts talking exactly like him. It's obviously Gandalf. The Numenorians make it back to find out her father, the king, has finally died. And if House of the Dragon has taught us anything, the death of a king is a good excuse for counselors to start scheming. Also, Isildur's sister happened to be with the king in his final moments where he was lucid and was like, you gotta read the prophecy ball, so now she knows that. And the forging of the rings is complete. Yes, we've got the three elven rings of power. But with Galatriel acting weird, Elrond did some snooping and found out Sauron was helping him. But he also doesn't say anything. He comes to the same conclusion that it'll be fine as long as Sauron doesn't, I don't know, in secret forge a master ring to rule them all. Which is, of course, exactly what he's gonna do. And that's where the Rings of Power Season 1 comes to an end. If you liked this recap, hit that subscribe button for more of the best recaps of TV and movies.